Check if the audio is coming. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, uh, let's get started. I'm guessing everyone has received two handouts today. One which has two root locus and step response for the system we were studying in the previous class. And the other one is about PID tuning, which I have, uh, which is a multiple page uh, section from the book. So let's continue with our uh, example in the previous class. Okay, so this was our system. We had four design specifications. Percent overshoot less than or equal to 5%, uh, which implied that zeta be greater than or equal to 0 0.69. Uh, the settling time must be less than 1.5 seconds, which implies zeta omega n must be greater than or equal to 2.6. These are for the dominant poles. The third one was if RS is equal to 1 over S, then ESS must be equal to 0. And the fourth design specification was if RS is a ramp input, then ESS must be less than or equal to 25%. Okay. Um, in the previous class, we had and uh, and the question is find KP and KI. Okay, which can achieve those four objectives. Um, that achieves. DS1 to DS4. Uh, I'm going to give you a negative answer today. So I went on the MATLAB and I did many, many simulations, many, many trial and errors, and I couldn't find anything that meets all those four requirements. Okay, so, so let me write it as there may be none. But we won't know whether such a thing exists or not. Uh, without going through certain steps. Well, actually in this case, I couldn't find it through trial and error after going through a lot of steps. So um, I'm very confident of the answer that there are no such KP and K K KI that will achieve all these four requirements at once. And what I'm going to do today is I'll show you that if you relax this requirement to around 30%, we will be able to meet all the requirements. So we, I can find a KP and KI that will meet all the requirements. Okay, so in the end, I'm going to change DS4 to ESS less than or equal to 30%. And then the solution would be, solution is in your second handout. KP equals to 25 and KI equals to 
Okay, so before we jump into this question, uh, I want to go back to the question we were studying in the previous class, and I want you to turn to page one of the root locus and the step response handout that I had given today. Okay, now let's look at the handout. Um, and w the first plot is the root locus for the transfer function. Uh, I mean, it, you can see the transfer function on top. So that's the, the root locus is for that transfer function. And I had drawn the root locus on board approximately in the previous class. And today we are confirmed that it looks exactly like I had drawn it in the previous class. Uh, and I had used this data cursor. I don't know if you have used the data cursor before on MATLAB or not, but you can use the data cursor to figure out what the value of gain and pole and damping coefficient and overshoot and all that stuff is at that particular point. So the frequency is omega n, okay? So for, the, for a value of gain 30.3, you see that the damping coefficient zeta is 0 0.724, so it's greater than 0 0.69, that's great. And the value of pole, the real part of the pole is minus 3.93, and we require it to be um, uh, less than minus 2.6, so that's perfect. Okay, so we meet both these requirements at that particular point. And in fact, there are many such points that meet these two requirements. Okay, so this is not the only point. But remember that our transfer function contains a zero. And what do we know about having a zero in a transfer function? Uh, does anyone remember what happened, what, what we studied for the second order case? What happens when there is a zero? Anyone remembers? Yeah. I'm not sure, but I think that fixes the percent overshoot rate. Sorry? That fixes the percent overshoot that changes the percent overshoot, yes. What about settling time? It increases slightly, not a whole lot. So when you have a zero in a transfer function uh, for a second order system, um, your percent overshoot increases by a huge margin, okay? So it could go all the way from, so if there was no zero, the percent overshoot would be 5%. If there is a zero, the percent overshoot would be 60%. So it can really go increase drastically if you have a zero in the system. Um, the settling time, on the other hand, changes only slightly. So it increases, but it increases very, uh, uh, very slightly by adding a zero. So if you had a settling time for a second order system to be 1.3 seconds and you added a zero, it might increase to 1.35 seconds or 1.4 seconds or 1.5 seconds, but it won't increase by an order of magnitude more. Uh, but the percent overshoot definitely increases by order of magnitude more. So in this case, we want the percent overshoot to be less than or equal to 5%. But we know that the closed loop system has a zero. So what was the closed loop system transfer function? KPS plus KI or <coughs> S cube plus 10 S square plus 16 plus KPS plus KI. So we derived this transfer function in the previous class. And since you have a zero here, uh, the percent overshoot, even if your closed loop system, so in this case, uh, it says that the percent overshoot is 3.71 at that particular point for a second order system. But remember, it's a third order system, so uh, it's only an approximation. Uh, because of a zero, the percent overshoot will be much higher than 3.71. Um, but I don't quite know what, how much it will be because I, it's a third order system and we are only making an approximation. And plus, it also has a zero. So anyways, I went ahead and I picked different points along the root locus where these two conditions were satisfied. And for that particular value of gain, so you see the value of gain 30.3 written on top, so that tells you what exactly is the gain at that particular point. 
So I plotted the step response and I looked at what the steady state value was. So the steady state value was always equal to one, so that's great because there is no error. Uh, the steady state error with respect to step response is zero. So the steady state uh, response was, the steady state was equal to one, so I need to make sure that the amplitude at the peak point should be 1.05 or 0 0.9, uh, well, yeah, 1.05 because it's a percent overshoot. And uh, it turns out that that is satisfied by picking a gain value of gain equal to 30. So I tried gain equal to 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, and at 30, it meets the requirement. I also found that the Settling time is 1.2 seconds, so at 1.2 seconds you can see that the amplitude is 1.02, so it's within the 2% uh, of the steady state value. So the settling time is around uh, 1.2 seconds, so that this expression is also, I mean this uh, requirement is also satisfied. Uh, if you pick Ki to be equal to 63, okay? So this was what we were doing in the previous class, and because my MATLAB wasn't functioning, I wasn't able to print out these uh, root locus, but now we have the root locus, so we can see exactly how things are working. The other thing I want you to notice in the root locus is at the value of gain 30.3, the complex poles are not necessarily the dominant poles. Okay, so the dominant pole has changed to the real pole, which is at minus 2.13, okay? All of you can see that? minus 2.13, so that's the dominant pole, and so that would affect the settling time, but not the percent overshoot. So anyways, uh, at the value of gain 30.3, uh, or at the value of gain equal to 30, uh, it looks like we are able to meet all the specifications. Well, in that case, the specification was only DS1 and DS2, and we had picked Ki to be 63. All right. Now, uh, towards the end of the previous class, we had, um, we had added these two conditions, these two more conditions, and we had let Ki also be a variable that needs to be determined. So now we need to determine both Kp and Ki so that these four requirements are met. So we realize that DS3 is always met. And the reason for that is because we have a PI controller. So um, usually with a PI controller, you will not have a steady state error with respect to a step input. So DS3 is always met. In order to meet DS4, we need Ki to be greater than 64 or greater than or equal to 64. So these two derivations were done in the previous class. Um, and now we want to we want to do two things. We want to identify a value of Ki over Kp, and we want to identify a value of Kp. Okay, so that all the requirements are met. Any questions so far? Okay. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that the closed loop system is stable. Yeah. Yes. You had a uh, question. Did we find that Ki is greater than or equal to 64 in like the previous class using the using the DS4 condition? Okay. Uh, do you have it or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, maybe I, uh, did I use the same notation in the previous class, KP and KI, or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, okay. All right, so I think that part we've done in the previous class. So now, uh, we will do the following things. So the first thing we are do going to do is find KP and KI range in which system is stable, uh, I should write closed loop system is stable, closed loop system is stable, then use 
asymptotes uh, formula to identify the range of KP and KI in which uh, settling time requirement is met and what else? There was a third step. Okay, these are the only two things I need to do. And of course, then use root locus to to compute KP and KI. Okay, these are the three steps that we need to do for computing the value of KP and KI. So let's uh, work on the first part. So the denominator of the closed loop system is a third order system. So I need to look at the denominator. I have S cube, S square, S raised to one, S raised to zero. 1, 16 plus kp, 10, and ki. Minus 1 over 10, ki minus 160 plus 10, kp. And this will be 0. And this is ki. Okay, yes. Is it supposed to be minus 10 kp? Oh yeah, of course. Thank you. Minus 10 kp, that's right. Okay, so what's the, under what conditions would we have a stable system? So there, this is positive, this is positive, so this must be positive and this must be positive. So we have ki greater than zero, And 16 plus kp, oh, when is this greater than 0? When ki minus 16 plus kp 10 is less than 0. So this means ki is less than 10, 16 plus kp, okay. So ki cannot be too large. If my ki is too large, my system will become unstable. We don't want that to happen. Okay. Uh, 
uh, I need my ki to be greater than or equal to 64. So this condition will automatically be satisfied. I don't want my ki to be very large in comparison to kp. Uh, I now look at the asymptotes to the root locus. So I look at this expression. So I have one zero and I have three poles. So how many, oh, uh, no, I have to look at the open loop system. So the op so GCG is KP S plus KI over KP over S, S plus two, S plus eight, right? So I need to pick a zero. Uh, so that, that would be the ratio of Ki and Kp, and I need to pick a value of Kp, right? So this is the GCG, which is the open loop transfer function between the error and the output. Um, how many asymptotes would it have? Would the root locus have for this particular system? So it has a third order in the denominator. So it has three poles and it has one zero, right? So it will have two, which is n minus m. So n is equal to three, m is equal to one. So it has one zero, three poles. So the number of asymptotes is equal to n minus m, which will be two. Uh, if you have two asymptotes, then their angles would be 90 degrees and 270 degrees. So they'll be uh, so I have in the if I look at the open loop transfer function, I have a zero, sorry, a pole at zero, a pole at minus two, a pole at minus eight. I have a zero at minus k i over k p. This is something that I need to pick. So the zero could be anywhere on the on the real axis. Uh, well, it, it has to be somewhere on this side, on the negative part of the real axis. But I can pick which point I want the zero to be in. So let's say the zero is between minus two and minus eight. Then the root locus is going to look like. The root locus is going to look like this. So this pole will start moving towards this zero as Kp goes from zero to infinity. And these two poles are going to come towards each other and then it will Wow, I have become very good at drawing root locus. Okay. Okay, so th there will be a breakaway point and then it will start going into a 90 degree direction and 270 degree direction. So those will be the asymptotes uh, for this particular root locus. And okay. We want to make sure that our dominant poles have zeta omega n greater than or equal to 2.6. What does that imply? The asymptotes must be must be on the uh, what is this left side? Yeah. So the asymptotes must be on the left side of this minus 2.6 line. Okay. I need to draw the asymptotes. So this is sigma a. Okay, so I want, so okay, what's the argument here? Uh, going back to the argument, my dominant poles must satisfy the real part should be less than or equal to minus 2.6. That's DS2, requirement DS2, which means in order for that to hold true, my sigma a must be less than minus 2.6. 
So let me write it formally. Need so ds2 implies sigma a must be less than minus 2.6. to meet the requirements. Now let me ask you a counter uh, question. What happens if sigma is greater than minus 2.6? Or in other words, my asymptotes are on this side of this minus 2.6 line. Any thoughts? Right, so the entire root locus will stay on the right side of minus 2.6, and the dominant poles will never be able to satisfy this condition, okay? So it's important that my sigma a, or the, the point of the asymptote, so the asymptote must be less than minus 2.6, so it should be on this side. That way, I'm assured that as I increase the value of kp, I will be assured that there will be points on the root locus with real part less than minus 2.6. Yes? Is that how, how you knew that you had to draw it in that direction? Oh. Um, because the asymptote is to the left of minus 2.6. So, so um, it could look, so let's say, well, let me draw. So I'm, see, I'm drawing, I'm putting a zero in between minus two and minus eight. So in this case, so, so there will be a breakaway point here because there is no, so this, once you start drawing the root locus, it is going to a pole. So between two poles, there has to be a breakaway point. Okay. Otherwise it, so in this case, it's, this pole is going to move towards this zero. So there will be no breakaway point here, but there will be a breakaway point here. Okay. Now. This asymptote could go in this direction or it could go in that in this direction, and that depends on what where sigma a is located. Okay? So sigma a essentially tries to capture this uh, this branch that is coming out of the the root locus or coming out in bit from the breakaway point. So that's why I want to make sure that my sigma a is placed in an appropriate location. Now sigma a depends on where my my minus ki over kp is. Okay, and we are going to see that in a few minutes. So that's why I want to place sigma a. So I, I want to pick ki over kp in an intelligent fashion so that my sigma a is to the right of minus 2.6, to the left of minus 2.6. Now what is the value of, what is the expression for sigma a? It's sum of poles minus sum of zeros over n minus m. So sum of poles is 0, minus 2, minus 8. Sum of zeros is minus ki over kp over 2. And I want this to be minus, less than minus 2.6. So this would imply my <coughs> ki over kp is less than minus 5.2 plus 10. Four point eight. 
uh, let me write it here. Okay. So, we identified the range in which uh, the system would be stable. We have identified the range of Ki so that the ramp requirement is met. Uh, we have identified the range for Ki over Kp so that uh, the DS2 requirement will be met. And now we need uh, the root locus to compute the value of Kp and Ki. Okay? Now this is where the trial and error comes to our rescue. Okay. So let's go back to the handout that I had given. Okay, and of course I have drawn only one root locus, so I started drawing root locus for, so I picked the value of zero, so remember I need to pick a value of zero, and the zero has to be less than 4.8 in order to make sure that, uh, well not zero, zero is minus Ki over Kp, uh, so Ki over Kp has to be less than minus four, uh, less than 4.8 so I plotted the root locus. So, so once I fix the value of Ki over Kp, all I need to do is use the root locus to get a, an appropriate value of Kp. So I fixed Ki over Kp to 4.6, 4.5, 4.4, okay, and I went all the way to 2.3. Uh, and I picked an appropriate value of Kp to make sure that all these requirements are met. Uh, and I found that the system requirements are not met, so all these requirements are not met by the uh, by that particular choice of zero. When I went to the zero of 2.3, then something cool happened. I could pick a value of Kp so that DS1, DS2, DS3 requirements are met, and DS4 is violated, but by only a small margin. Uh, by 5%, okay? So I need to ensure, I, I mean, I need to change the DS4 to 30%, in which case I can pick Kp equals to 25, so that's the point plotted on the root locus, for which the corresponding Ki is 57.5, so this is 25 into 2.3. Okay. Now if you look at the closed loop poles on the root locus for Ki over Kp equals to 2.3, you will notice the following things. So the pole, the re real part of the pole is minus 3.64. So this is, this requirement is met by the uh, complex poles, then the damping coefficient is 0 0.794, so that's much higher than 0 0.69, which was the requirement. Um, the percent overshoot was 1.64, uh, but as I've mentioned, because you have a zero, the percent overshoot will be much higher than 1.64 that is given in the root locus. So in this case, the percent overshoot is exactly 5%. And what else? Oh, and the gain is 24.8, so I'm picking a gain 25, which is close to 24.8. And I plot the step response, so you can see that the amplitude is uh, 1.05 at the peak value. Uh, at time 
t equals to 1.5, the amplitude is 1.02, so that's 2% settling time, so this requirement is also met. Um, the steady state value is 1, not surprising because the steady state error is supposed to be 0 for a step input for the closed loop system, and, but the ramp requirement is not met. Okay, it's slightly higher than 25%. So any questions on this? This is exactly how you would be designing controllers in the future. So you will make sure that things are state, the closed loop system is stable. Given the design requirements, you will try to figure out where you should place the closed loop poles or at least the complex, uh, the complex poles that are closest to the uh, imaginary axis. And then in the final step, you will have to go through several rounds of trial and error to identify what values would meet all the requirements. Okay, there is no clear answer. Sometimes if you're not able to meet the requirements, as is the case in this particular problem, it's quite unfortunate that we cannot really prove that the requirements will not be met. Okay, all we can do is run many more trials and error. So for instance, in this case, I ran the trial and error for almost an hour before I conversed to this particular solution. Okay, so you may have to go for more trial and error, maybe two hours, maybe three hours, to figure out whether all these requirements would be met or not. Okay, any question on that? Yes? So, is KP gain, because like this is 24.8, and we said KP is 25, are they meant to be the same value, or is it a coincidence? Uh, no, I, I uh, you can pick 24.8, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. So this gain is KP? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm plotting, I'm, so I'm fixing the value of KI over KP. Okay, so I need, I need KI over KP to be less than 4.8. So I'm fixing the value of KI over KP to be 2.3 or 2.4 or 2.5. And then I plot the root locus to figure out what the value of KP is at which the closed loop poles have the desired characteristics. Any other question? Yes. Uh, the values of KP and KI that we got over here, is that for the steady state error to be less than about 30%, right? Yes. Okay. With respect to the ramp input. Yeah. Any other question? OK. So this brings me to the next topic, which is PID controllers, and which is one of the most widely used controllers in uh, process control. And in this particular case, we were trying to design a PI controller, and PID controller has three parameters instead of two. So we need to design three parameters. Okay, so this is a PID controller. Uh, so the output is ES KP plus KI over S plus KD S.
Okay. So in the previous example, we were designing a controller that was a PI controller, uh, but more generally PID controller is the most versatile class of controllers where you multiply the error by a proportional factor, you integrate the error multiplied by some other proportional factor, you differentiate the error, okay, and then multiply it by uh, some other proportional factor. So this is the Laplace transform of KPET KI integral of ET DT, DT plus KD DE over D, DT. Okay? You look at the slope of the error. You look at the error itself, you look at the slope of the error, and you look at the aggregate error until this point of time. You multiply it by an appropriate factor, and that enters into the system. The idea of using PID controller came from ship control system. So in those days, well, no, even nowadays people control ships. Um, yeah, there are pilots for ships as well. We don't know about it, but they do exist. Uh, but in those days, there were passenger ships as well. Titanic was one of them. Uh, and the captain of the ship would steer the ship using so they were, of course, skilled people. They didn't think about it in terms of PID controller, but people who were observing the captain of the ship, uh, or rather the control theorist at that particular point of time, he was observing the captain of the ship, and then he realized, or he distilled the fact that the captain of the ship is using a PID controller to steer the ship in an appropriate direction. So that's where the, the idea of PID controller came into uh, control theory. And after that, of course, this is now widely used across all uh, spectrum. So from power electronics to chemical plants to nuclear plants and so on, PID controllers are widely used because it's very versatile, very robust okay, to any uh, disturbances that might have happened in the system. Those things are very hard to prove mathematically because Many systems are highly nonlinear and uh, exhibit very different classes of behavior. Uh, but nonetheless, PID controllers have turned out to be very useful, even for nonlinear systems. So don't think of it just for just useful for a linear system. They're also useful for nonlinear systems to achieve desired characteristics. Now, what does PID controller uh, doing to the system? So let me rewrite this controller, so GCG is KP, or rather KD, S square plus K um, KD S square plus KP over KD S plus KI over KD multiplied by G. Okay, so I can rewrite PID controller in this particular form. Uh, multi so GCG is given by this expression, and 
If you look at this uh, second order numerator, uh, you can split it into two zeros, so s plus z1, s plus z2, uh, where z1 and z2 are something you can design because you have complete control over kp, the value of kp over kd and ki over kd. So you can pick z1 and z2 according to your favorite location. You need to pick an appropriate value of kd. And what you're doing is to the transfer function g, you're adding two zeros and you're adding a pole at origin. Okay, that's what PID controller is doing. So in this particular system, going back to our discussion here, we added one zero because we had just a PI controller. So we added one zero at minus KI over KP and it was a real zero. Uh, in this case, you can pick a complex zeros as well because you have a pair of zeros to pick. So in this case, we had one real zero and we had, uh, because of the PI controller, we put a, a, a pole at the origin. And that changes the system, the changes the root locus of the overall closed loop system, or rather the open loop system, but uh, GC is included in the open loop system. And it could change the direction in which the asymptotes are going and so on and so forth. I mean, adding a zero and adding a pole at the origin in this particular situation made a lot of different changes to the root locus of the transfer function. Okay, and because remember that the zero was something we could pick, so you could have picked the zero here, you could have picked the zero here, and that would completely change the way the root locus looks. Um, so it's really very useful um, for designing controllers and shaping the root locus in a manner that all the design specifications would be met. Now, of course, it's very difficult to, so as you saw, it was very difficult to tune just two parameters, ki and kp, to meet the design requirement because it took, uh, we had to go through a series of steps. You, when you have three such design parameters, it becomes even more difficult. And so what I did was um, I printed out a handout which talks about Ziegler-Nicole's tuning method. It's a very complicated tuning method for tuning kp, ki, and kd for a PID controller. Uh, I want you to go through the tuning method on your own. Uh, I'm not going to cover it in the class, but this um, handout tells you in detail exactly how to pick an appropriate value of KP, KI, and KD using a trial and error method, okay? So again, there is some steps that you need to follow and after which, at the end of the steps, you get some nominal values of KP, KI, and KD, and then you need to start fine tuning the solution by trial and error. So. Um, make sure that you read this handout before you come to the next class. Uh, or rather, I mean, you can read your handout whenever you want because uh, I'll give you some assignments re related to that, but uh, it won't necessarily come as part of the examination. So you will learn it when you are doing the assignment. In the next class, we'll talk about frequency response methods and, uh, um, yeah, and then subsequent topics. So. Thank you and see you on Friday.